Recording in progress. Now, may now, I may ask that everybody, everybody keep your keep questions, your questions until, after until after the presentation, the presentation rather, rather than, than interrupting, interrupting unless, unless there's something that you, that you don't understand, understand and absolutely need, need clarification. clarification. Thank you Thank so you much. So much. I'll hand over to you, you now, Nicola. Nicola. Thanks, Michelle, and a very kind and warm um, introduction. So I'm a clinical neuropsychologist, and I am here to talk to you about functional neurological disorder. But I want to let you know that until very recently, I hadn't seen that many clients with FMD, and now I am seeing more and more. So essentially, I'm taking your, you on my learning journey that I sort of embarked on a couple of years ago. And um, for those of you that are already familiar, it's quite an unfolding space and we're getting a lot more research and understanding of the condition. But I guess why am I here and, and no one else? Now I'm just trying to move my slides and I'm not sure what's going on. Here we go. So as I said in the introduction, I am a clinical neuropsychologist. Um, the doctor is because I did a PhD. Now it wasn't a school of medicine at UNSW, but it was still in, um, well, it was a neuropsychiatry topic actually. Um, I have 28 years of clinical experience. So my first job was actually in the Royal Ride Rehabilitation Brain Injury Unit. And, um, and dare I say it, that was in 1994. Um, I've done a lot of research. I am a self-confessed nerd, um, so I've done formal research that's been peer-reviewed, but also obviously my own interest areas, which resulted in a couple of books. And I'm also uh, a, on the editorial board of Neuropsychology Review, which is actually a very high um, impact journal for neuropsychologists and a good source for other people who are curious in our domain. So I am just presenting functional neuropsychological disorder from the perspective of a neuropsychologist. And one of the things that my colleagues and I have been talking about is particularly with COVID, we are noticing more and more um, interesting presentations and a lot more emotional, psychological complications, complexities and burden in, in cases that we're seeing. Um, and I think that's quite curious. Um, but obviously, as I said, that we need more research. Now, just to uh, put some history in place, um, we had the diagnosis of hysteria. Um, you know, it was in the times where hysterectomies were rife because women were perceived as, as emotional creatures and they had hysteria. We now understand that women have very complex uh, emotional, hormonal, um, hormonal lives and those changes in hormone, hormones have a big impact on, on their mental health and also there's the whole issue that men didn't experience periods so they thought it was all imagined and, and now there's been research as late as in the 1990s that found that menstrual um, pain was legitimate and so the words of hysteria they got dropped from the diagnostic vernacular and we used, started to use a word conversion disorder um, because we noticed that it wasn't just women that could be hysterical, it applied to men as well. And so the word conversion disorder and, and covers both male and females who present with a, and I do apologise if you can hear the building site opposite, it just started at 11 o'clock today. So conversion disorder is when a person is presenting with neurological symptoms that cannot be explained by um, medical examination. Um, examination. Now, functional neurological symptoms are considered real and they cause psychological distress. Now, that's going to be a really important thing when I talk about some cases later on. People who don't have psychological distress, probably not functional neurological disorder at the beginning anyway. Um, and um, you need to have a look at other considerations. Um, and it's not due to damage per se to structure, so that's why nothing shows up. Um, but it's got to do with change in, in function. Now, one of the best ways to give life to these things is actually to have a case study. So I have seen this gentleman, this 28-year-old male, on uh, three occasions over about three to four years. And he had a mild traumatic brain injury on objective measure. And by that, I mean his PTA, sorry, post-traumatic amnesia duration is less than one hour. His Glasgow coma scale score was 14 at the scene, a very short period of, of diminished GCS. And what is notable is that he deteriorated over the three years that I saw him in terms of increasing neurological symptoms were being reported and his cognitive um, profile demonstrated cognitive decline. 
So if you like, this is the profile, so time one, and then over time you can see that his cognitive capacity went down and his complaint of neurological symptoms went up. Now, when cases do not follow the normal course of recovery, you have to question what is going on. Now, it doesn't mean that there's uh, a neurological symptom. It doesn't uh, it mean that there's a profound psychological difficulty, but it could. And so we need to understand and make sense of it. And one of the things that if you've got this red flag that someone's not getting better, they're reporting strange neurological symptoms uh, that there doesn't seem to be any basis for, then you need to raise the flag of it's a possible functional neurological disorder. Uh, and I see people who, um, I often seem to get a too hard basket. Uh, and sometimes the care before they get referred to a neuropsychologist or a neuropsychiatrist, um, they can be given feedback that it is absolutely exacerbates the condition and is not helpful to their longer term recovery. And, um, you know, as a self-reflecting clinician, we're meant to know our biases and prejudices. I'll declare, declare mine straight up. I have a bias that all the research I've been involved with, including with my PhD, that employment is really good for your mental, cognitive, and psychological well-being. So my bias is always to try and help people work in some capacity, voluntary work or in an employment position. So I, I will put that up front. And we're getting some feedback. So, and I think that's my feedback. Okay, bear with me. I'm not sure why that's happening. I stopped talking and it kept going, so maybe it's not me. So let's have a look at the diagnostic criteria, DSM-5, because it is a new diagnosis. So you have one or more symptom of altered voluntary motor or sensory function, which the young man I presented did. He started, uh, he had an abnormal or bizarre uh, walk. He started to have a hemiparesis uh, and he developed um, significant language difficulties, a stutter, for example. Uh, now, the clinical findings were completely incompatible with this development of symptoms. Uh, and he saw about four neurologists. So it's, he certainly had the complete workup and examination. So it cannot not be said that um, appropriate investigations weren't carried out. Now, his symptoms or difficulties weren't explained by another medical condition or uh, a mental health issue. So a diagnosis of, of um, depression or anxiety or anything like that doesn't manifest that way. Now, I'm, I understand there are a lot of clinicians on board, you know, the notion of brain fog. Now, brain fog is not diagnostic. Um, so many people report brain fog. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of different conditions that can result in brain fog. And none of them are from the head up, which is, I guess, my territory. There can be a lot of uh, head down things that can cause brain fog. Um, so I guess the invitation is to probably delve a little bit deeper into the symptoms that are being reported, particularly if you think you might refer to a neuropsychologist, someone like me. So the symptoms and deficits cause distress. Now, the young man I saw had a very complicated picture because some of his things appeared to cause distress and other things didn't. And there were a lot of complexities and contradictions and inconsistencies in his presentation. Now, Importantly, functional neurological disorder is not an exclusive diagnosis. So you can have comorbidities, uh, including somatic um, symptom disorder, um, any of the mental health disorders, um, and I guess, dare I say it, um, I don't like the word fictitious disorder. I don't use that. Um, and I guess in medical legal terms, neuropsychologists, we don't use the term malingering either because we don't actually know people's motivation. But he also had an element of um, exaggeration and um, feigning. And I can, um, as I said, there were lots of inconsistencies at quite a significant functional level in this young man. Now, you can specify the subtype if you know, so weak paralysis, and that obviously helps communicate to other people, particularly if you are going to refer on to treatment. Um, and treatment has been found to be very uh, helpful because, and this is, I think, a differential, it says it causes distress. Now, the people I have met with functional neurological disorder 
want to get better. People with other conditions tend not to want to get better. Um, and I think that's really an important uh, differential um, up front and, a, and an interview can uh, clearly uh, delineate that. So I did mention somatic symptom disorder. Oh, sorry, I'm just gonna go back, okay. I did mention somatic symptom disorder and I think, and talking to my colleagues, that there is also an increase of this presentation. Uh, and as you are aware, we've had sort of diagnoses available to us for a long period of time. So it's not necessarily that uh, there's a new diagnosis and everyone's jumping on and diagnosing it more. As I said, I've been a clinician for 28 years and I'm definitely seeing more people presenting with somatic symptom disorders and functional neurological disorders than I ever have um, previously. So somatic symptom disorder, again, it's got to cause distress and significant disruption to daily function. Now the thing here is that there is a lot of thoughts and feelings vested into the, the symptom and behaviours related to it. Um, and my, um, in the cases that I have experienced, and I did say at the beginning, you know, this is this is something relatively new for me. And when I say new, I mean a couple of years. Um, the people I have met with FND from my Example, from a neuropsychological perspective, don't appear to have the ruminations and the fixations and the um, amount of time, energy and attention, that's the sweet tea that neuropsychologists talk about, time, energy and attention, devoted to their symptoms in the way that someone with somatic symptom disorder might. And I guess if they're like that, you also have to maybe query some sort of um, psychotic possibility. Um, maybe there might be some delusional um, bases and then they may actually have some sort of somatic hallucinations. Now obviously if you're not in neuropsychiatry or psychiatry this might actually start to make you feel uncomfortable. That's fine, it just means that you need to refer to someone who kind of works in that space that they can possibly tease out the somatic symptom disorder from the sort of psychosis, delusional, um, hallucinatory um, aspects that I have met people who, who do have and a, and a, clin a good clinical interview, issue, issue, uh, interview sorry, can pull those out. Persistently um, high level of anxiety about their health symptoms. And it's interesting because of COVID, I've also noticed that it was a lot higher anxiety with them. So for example, seeing people with a post-concussive syndrome in the last couple of years, there's a lot more anxiety about their health. Naturally, COVID has made a lot of people more acutely aware of their health. Um, and they're focusing on symptoms in a way that they wouldn't have previously. Um, the people who sort of don't seem to pay attention to the minor symptoms are those that have actually had major symptoms and major illnesses, um, in my experience at the moment with the current climate. Um, and again, excessive energy or time devoted to the symptoms and health concerns. So these are people who you might see who drop a shop and, and ask for lots of scans and so forth. Um, now, the interesting thing is it doesn't have to be consistent in this, but there has to be something continuously present um, for a diagnosis of somatic symptom disorder. Now, you wanted to hear about functional neurological disorder, so I'll continue sharing my teaching. Really important, the presentation can vary markedly. Now, I'm a neuropsychologist, so I tend to obviously see people with reporting cognitive difficulties, but even those can and vary significantly. Um, and, you know, they have this functional presentation uh, and Sutter, I've mentioned swallowing, gait disorder, and other interesting upper and lower limb impairment. Now I did see a man who for basically developed a, a functional neurological disorder uh, sorry, that was my diagnosis um, with exaggeration, uh, who had a, a bout of food poisoning overseas um, in the capacity of their employment. They had a bout of food um, poisoning while stationed overseas. They, they, it resolved, they came back to Australia and they developed this quite bizarre um, neurological picture. They developed a, a, a twitch, uh, a muscular jerking, um, and as a result, they felt that they, uh, they couldn't work anymore because they couldn't hold the head in a vertical position um, as they did their, their, um, their convulsive movement. And, and it was something like this. It was a kind of weird thing like that. 
and um, they were referred to me because they were reporting cognitive difficulties as well. Now, what was really obvious about this person's presentation is there was no distress. Um, and I would have thought that um, there would have been. Um, this person um, still wanted to present themselves as highly functioning. And I always think it's very funny when, not funny in a, in a malicious, mean way, but funny when someone tells you they're super intelligent when they are in front of you to do uh, an intelligence test about uh, about other things. So he was very clearly telling me about how important he'd been and how capable he was. And then he was with this, um, this movement disorder. And I conducted my assessment and, um, and I, I went out on a limb and I, I have spoken to this about my colleagues beforehand because we all do this sometimes. And I said to him, look, you're, you're performing quite badly and I'm really concerned about your ability to drive because he told me he's driving and, I, and he drives his children. And I said to him, I think he must be getting, I think he might need a break because um, all his symptoms are, are becoming incredibly pronounced. So he didn't just have the movement disorder cognitively, his profile wasn't making sense. And I said, you know, I'm really concerned about your driving. Um, I, I think you're going to have to contact someone to come and pick you up and take your car because I cannot in all consciousness let you drive home from this appointment because you're presenting so badly. Um, but how about you go and have time out, get a coffee and, and we'll come, come back and see. Anyway, he came back and there were no more twitches. So in a functional neurological disorder, you would not see that happen. The symptom would persist. Okay, so that's a really important differentiation. Now, there's positive signs and that's what you're looking for. Now, um, for those of you non-neurologists, -neuro um, just a little segue, the Hoover sign actually was developed in 1908. It's interesting, it's over 110 years old. And it was developed to differentiate between non-organic neurological things and organic Problem. So, you know, it's been a long time that humans have been trying to differentiate these um, two presentations and it is a bedside test. And, and basically, if someone's talking, saying to you they have um, a leg hemiparesis, the test is based on um, the motor sign based over on the crossover extensor reflex and you put your hands under people's heels and you ask them to lift the non-hemiparesis leg and um, if you feel the weight going into your hands then that's considered a positive sign. So if pressure is felt, then it's a positive sign. Um, and entrainment by contrast is um, basically it's the capacity to do two things at once. So entrainment is if you're distracted and if this consistent, uh, the symptom persists, then, then that's a, a positive sign versus if the change of attention, a functional tremor, for example, will cease. And I see this when I, after the interview, when I start getting people to do neuropsychological tasks, that a lot of symptoms actually completely go away because they're so busy concentrating and they can't manufacture the symptom um, and do the task at the same time. As I said, the, um, so that's, that's an important um, differentiation. So a functional tremor, it will cease when you give them a person something to do. So it's not just simply a diagnosis of excluding a medical condition, a neurological condition. You actually have to rule things in as well by looking at, you know, and that's history taking and positive signs and, and so forth. Now, there is this question about do we need to have a multidisciplinary team involved in the diagnosis or can it be a single individual clinical diagnosis? Um, I personally think it's good to get more than um, one pair of eyes on complicated cases. So I would err to the multidisciplinary team. Um, and, and, and certainly I'd want someone to have a full neurological workup um, if I was going to see them in, in this capacity. So you can see that there's a lot of movement disorders um, involved in FND. And, you know, you think of psychogenic movement disorders, uh, I guess a simple way to describe them would be the unwanted movements, such as spasms or, like I said, the shaking, the jerks, ticks. I mean, a tick we know are neurological, but sometimes they can, they can look like a, a tick. Um, and they can present in the face, you know, the neck, the trunk and the limbs and so forth. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, like the young man I saw, you know, he developed this very bizarre gait um, of difficulties and, um, and he reported balance problems and so forth. And psychogenic movement disorders are caused by an underlying stress or, or psychological condition. Um, and as we'll see later on, FND do not need to be. Now... For the insurers listening to this, um, 
and I guess neurologists if they haven't already un worked this out from their own practice, it's FNDs now are presenting as the second most common reason to see a neurologist after headache. And headaches like brain fog and fatigue and tiredness are horrible symptoms to, um, to work with as clinicians because multiple conditions uh, result in, in, the, in these sorts of symptoms. Um, so a well-defined functional neurological disorder is estimated to account to 5 to 10% of new consultations. And uh, it does disproportionately uh, affect women, although the incidence of men you can say is increasing. Um, and it costs a lot of money. Now in Australia, I could not find any costings um, in Australia, and I guess that's an invitation to, uh, to any of the people out there that work in that scope um, to do costings on insurance burden. Um, we don't know, but it costs a, a, a huge amount of money. And as I indicated, the rumours on the, on the clinical ground are that the, the presentations are increasing. Um, but they're comparable to other care intensive neurological disorders. And FND is care intensive, but um, as I said, it causes distress and people want to get better. Um, and I'll talk about it later, but one of my colleagues does amazing treatment. So the interesting thing about functional neurological disorder is that 40% actually don't have a major psychological issue underpinning their diagnoses. So this is when they've actually had people do a thorough um, psychiatric workup. Previously, the older models really did focus on the psychological factors as being crucial, but now we understand, and I guess borrowing from some of the pain research, that there can be other things going on. Excuse me. So more contemporary models, as I've indicated, are focusing on the role of attention to symptoms uh, and belief structures. And what I think is really interesting and a potentially a bit of a nightmare in, in the um, compensable injury uh, system is that you don't need to establish a temporal relationship between the psychological factors and the onset of functional symptoms. The other interesting thing is People can develop functional neurological disorder associated with someone else's experience, and that will, I'll come to that when we talk about the, the model. So I saw a woman, this is to give things a, a different priority. Really, again, really interesting presentation. I was not the first psychologist to have seen her. She had treatment and assessment. Um, and the reason why that I thought this was really interesting is because there was clearly, you know, with um, consent, I was able to access um, previous files uh, of information. And I saw her at time three. Um, sorry, yes, I did. Um, and things got worse again. Um, I didn't see her the fourth time, but my results were requested. And um, after everything was, after an appropriate time, the clinician and I, um, needed to speak a bit more, trying to understand um, what was going on for her. Now, she she did have clear distress, and um, and as I said, you know, when you're in the medical legal system, you're not meant to give uh, clinical advice, and clients know that. But because of the differential issue of distress and treatment, um, I did um, make the comment to her. And I said, you know, if it was possible to have treatment for this, um, you know, how would you think about what would you think about that and so forth? And and, um, and she she was she was very excited about the possibility of treatment. Um, however, she was still in the litigation system, and, and sometimes that is another factor that we, we need to consider. But um, other people, because not everyone I see is in in, in the in the medical legal system, um, you can really see some really good results of, of treatment. So you can see, I don't know if you can differentiate. But the colours here, but um, uh, her cognitive capacity um, changed, her neurological symptoms were very stable, but her psychological condition kept changing. And I guess I put this up there to show you that there is some, there was something else going on for this woman, um, and it made no difference to the presentation of the functional neurological disorder, which we would expect given that a significant number um, don't have any psychological basis to issues, although they might be an exacerbating factor. So I just thought that was really, really interesting and, and um, it shows that we've got to keep an open mind across the duration of the disease, uh, sorry, of the disorder. 
So I've already alluded to the complexity and the development of new models. And, you know, I do like the biopsychosocial models. Um, if anyone in, in the audience who also does pain work, you'll, um, you'll know that this probably looks a bit like some of the pain models because um, the, there are multiple models and the models that I find resonate with the presentations that I see include this biopsychosocial um, aspect to them. And I said to you that there can be this catastrophic misinterpretation. Now, I've had people um, who developed an FND because someone else in their family had a neurological condition. Um, and in fact, uh, about a month ago, I saw what psychiatry would call a folly a deux. So I saw a young man who's, um, who had a workplace injury, um, fell over, had a shoulder injury, no loss of consciousness. His mother had had a motor vehicle accident um, nine years earlier. This is a good history taking. She'd had a neurological, uh, and she had neurological um, issues associated with having a moderate mild traumatic, sorry, a moderate brain injury. They both presented with profound neurological symptoms. I mean, the mum arrived with a hand in a splint. He arrived with um, complete immobility. So his FND had become this upper limb, uh, well, actually complete upper limb um, paresis. And there was so much mirroring going on. Um, there's clearly a FND going on for the son, but there's a lot um, very enmeshed. Um, when he finished school, he became his mum's carer. His sister was showering him. I mean, there was a lot of biopsychosocial aspects to the case that were perpetuating it. Um, but it, under that model, he was mirroring a lot of the symptoms of, of his mother. And so his what had been a shoulder injury um, he took this catastrophic misinterpretation, if you like, and he absolutely took the sick role. He looked after his mum for two years. Um, she made the comment that she'd finally let him go, and so he'd only been in the job for two weeks when he had his injury, and he had been completely supported in the sick role by his stepfather and his sister. As I said, his sister was showering him, which, you know, to a psychologist or anyone, that's an absolute flag of a problem. Um, and so he developed this complete profile that kind of mirrored his mother. Um, yes, there was insurance involved, and so I do tend to like this model. And, and even um, it just helps encourage you to, to get a bigger view of, of these sorts of complex cases. Um, you know, I think humans, we do, we do tend to think linear, and we do like things that are black and white. And um, as psychologists, as a neuropsychologist, you know, most of life is in the grey. So we, we do need to cover off these things. And the thing about a neuropsychological assessment, um, apart from the fact that a, a, a good, I say a good interview, that's a, a judgment. My interviews last 19 minutes to two hours. Um, so, we, you know, a, a thorough interview, we cover in our assessment, we can do personality inventory. So we can start looking at illness behaviour, um, behaviour beliefs, pain beliefs, uh, as well as um, people who sort of internalise their symptoms versus those who demonstrate their symptoms. We can measure their psych psychological symptoms. Uh, we measure their cognitive function, so we can actually work out whether there is a um, cognitive impairment in the sense of, of a memory problem that's impacting our day to day. And of course, I think everyone knows that we have inbuilt uh, effort measures, validity scales, um, and other of ways of, of looking at consistency uh, in presentation. And um, people ask me about uh, effort tests. All I can tell you is that a horse could pass them. So if someone's telling you that a, a, a person is not passing effort tests, then you have to work really hard to fail um, the embedded tests that we use. And we have symptom scales. And that helps because a symptom of brain fog or tiredness or headache actually doesn't mean a lot. And we actually really need to start to tease these out. The question as a neuropsychologist is whether we assess at all. And I saw someone that was so obviously presenting with a functional neurological disorder. It was in the medical legal system. I actually felt that the assessment would um, exacerbate the, the condition. Um, not because, I mean, I validated that the person had concerns. So as I said at the beginning, a person with a functional neurological disorder does actually, um, they're, not, they're not contrived and manufactured the way like a fictitious disorder or, or the presentation I, I mentioned before. Um, 
And so it is important to validate the experience. And this is when we talk about, you know, the hardware's fine, it's just the software and function that's not working very well. Now, what I decided to do was not do the cognitive assessment because I actually wanted to give this person the opportunity to have treatment. Um, and then I wanted to assess them after it. So I actually didn't complete the assessment. And, and that's one of the, um, you know, when I talk to people who are far more expert in this area than I am, so one of my colleagues in, in Queensland has done a bit of research in this area and, and I thank her for her um, mentoring me. Um, you know, she says you should always stop and question yourself whether you actually should be diagnosing or actually give the person the option of having, having some treatment because as I said, um, people respond amazingly well if they've got a neurological disorder. And a neurological disorder may have still have the overlay of exaggeration like that young man I mentioned, um, which is important. Now, there is this sort of nocebo cognitive behavioral um, model as well, which you know I'm a, I do in my, because um, I don't do, just do assessments, I do do therapy, but I don't do therapy for functional neurological disorder. There are people um, who I think might be better qualified than I do, than I am. But I, I definitely use CBT and psychoeducation and CBT can be incredibly effective um, and have really quite immediate um, benefits. The caveat to that though, um, at speaking at a wider level, because I'm aware of my audience, if people have significant cognitive impairment or are um, intellectually challenged, so people with below average intellectual capacity, cognitive behaviour therapy can actually be quite difficult because they actually haven't got the cognitive resources to sort of make rational corrections and so forth, which is required in, in the therapy model. Um, in which case, you know, doing really concrete things and it takes a bit longer um, is perhaps more, more helpful. So um, we do need to talk about malingering. Uh, and I don't use that word um, because malingering, uh, by definition, assumes that you know someone's motivation. So I think the terms people use, like to use is suboptimal. Um, I use suboptimal, but feigning and malingering have, have a connotation that you, you actually understand someone conscious, deliberate uh, motivations for monetary gain. Um, people can perform suboptimally or exaggerate for <laughs> a myriad of reasons um, and not just one. So consideration must be given to other forms of secondary gain. Um, yes, there is financial gain. There's the sick role gain. Um, the woman case study I showed you earlier, she conversation with her indicated that she really lacked a lot of support from her family and even though it, she had a lot going on but that one of the psychological things for her was she really wanted time out and she had other things going on like she was, she was going through menopause and um, one of my books that happens to be on menopause so we, we do understand now that for some women menopause is a significant risk time for cognitive difficulties and emotional difficulties as well as psychosocial things, you know, empty nest and a whole lot of things. So for her, there was this, this significant rest time out need that she was reporting. Um, and sometimes um, people would have that, uh, particularly for workplace accidents. Uh, and we know that um, people uh, having concussive, post-concussive injuries in the workplace are more likely to report post-concussive symptoms and more of them, more of them, more frequently if they have their concussion in the workplace versus having a concussion riding their horse on the weekend, for example. Um, and so another factor coming in, in that I have found in workplace injuries is if people feel that the workplace wasn't sympathetic to them, they have a sense of justice. Um, and a, a sense of justice can, can obviously feed into that sort of secondary gain thing of, of a balancing of the scales and, and things like that. And sometimes, you know, a, the personality assessments that lots of neuropsychologists and psychologists use sort of do look at those sorts of um, features and elements as well. The young man I saw definitely had a, a deliberate suboptimal optimal presentation to him. Um, I don't think the gains were just 
financial. There was definitely a lot of sick roles. But one of the interesting things uh, about his presentation um, was the fact that he had had two children after his injury. And there was this whole um, I'm trying to think of a word that doesn't sound um, judgmental. Um, and I was going to say collusion, but there's this whole major social family network. Um, when I say colluding, what I mean is, I guess, supporting um, this exaggerated presentation uh, for him, in addition to the, the the functional neurological disorder. But that that um, assessment, you know, there are there are more than uh, I, I wasn't the only person involved of it in the case because he had a speech pathologist because of the stutter neurologist and and so forth. So again, you know, it might not be cut and dry, and um, and that's working in the grey. But in terms of working out the best way forward for people, it's important to start identifying all these, these complexities. Now, what is really interesting is that imaging, um, so I said there's not structural changes, there does seem to be some changes on functional imaging. So, for example, you can see here that Elliot has found that there seems to be some decreased functional connectivity between the sensor motor cortices um, and the TPO junction. And so there is, and, and, and it's funny, isn't it? Because um, we know that eye gaze goes in a different direction if you're retrieving something from semantic knowledge versus making something up and here I'm going like that. So we know that there are functional imaging studies that show different um, brain activation patterns in the same way I, my eye gaze has gone up trying to think of about what I'm saying and, and retrieving information from long-term store. Um, and so this is a new area and, and um, I think we need to watch the space, but it doesn't um, contradict what I said at the very beginning that we don't find any functional changes. Uh, sorry, we don't find structural changes, we find functional changes. And I guess this is one of those things, what comes first, because my PhD was actually in neuroplasticity. And so we know that, um, you know, thinking patterns like your occupational thinking patterns, for example, actually starts to change your brain through the process of neuroplasticity. So in the same way, if people are having um, sort of pronounced um, rumination, um, illness, focused behaviour and so far, it begs the question is, is there some neuroplastic connectivity changes going on as well? Um, and did they come first and then they show up on imaging? Or, you know, did they have that tendency beforehand and it's been exacerbated? These are sort of, this is my um, question space, if you like, because I actually don't have the answers to these questions, but these are some of the things that, um, being the um, little nerd that I am, um, that I'm starting to, to, to mull over, um, given my PhD in neuroplasticity. So there is this beginning of, um, of research and you'd expect this hyper arousal of the amygdala um, being the emotional part for those non-clinicians, uh, emotional sort of arousal, sympathetic nervous system um, part of the brain, fight and flight, that sort of area. The amygdala, um, it's bilateral, sits next to memory, um, memory and the hippocampi and the uh, amygdala sit side by side. So memory and emotion interplay constantly and we know that emotional state impacts what we remember. Um, so we know that there's things going on, but we don't, um, at least I don't in my research, uh, have the full picture in that space and it requires a lot more uh, research. Now, there is um, a cognitive profile to functional neurological disorder. And I guess, um, and I'm not saying this to be, you know, because I want everyone to start referring to me or neuropsychologists. Um, obviously, as a profession, we probably are a bit underutilised. But if you catch yourself reading something that someone's reporting cognitive difficulties, then it's probably necessary to refer them to a neuropsychologist for a cognitive um, assessment. Um, and so people often report with vague cognitive complaints. 
Um, but vague cognitive complaints are very common in a range of disorders that's not necessarily neurological. Uh, and one of the things is we can, in, through our assessments, tease out different things. So, you know, we know that depression or schizophrenia, they're both heterogeneous um, psychiatric conditions, but on neuropsych testing, they actually look different. Um, and so, you know, I, I do suggest that you investigate further when someone says, you know, I've got memory problems. Well, what kind of memory problem are we talking about? You know, is it um, autobiographical memory? Can the person remember what they did yesterday? Can they remember what, what they did 10 years behind? Or you could just simply refer to someone like me and, and we'll sort it out for you. So the research studies, um, and as I said, this is quite a new um, area for study. So, you know, um, there's always a delay with getting studies to match the diagnoses after the latest DSM and, um, and get going through uh, all the, the process to, to, to publication. But there is a suggestion of slowed information, um, right, sorry, delayed information processing speed and higher order attention. And that's simply because the person may be just they've got too much brain power resting on, on the symptoms. And that is very marked in somatic symptom disorder. And again, that's why it's, it's really good to, to get that d distracting task um, inserted in there to see what, what happens. Um, and as I've just noted there at the bottom, you know, some people do, a lot of people complain about brain fog and, and um, that's, just, that's a non-helpful symptom. So because some people are presenting more with cognitive complaints than perhaps neurological ones, there is now, as you can see, 2020, it's not that old, there is uh, this proposed definition that perhaps we actually need to have an FCD diagnosis. And, and the suggestion here is that you'd have one or more symptoms of impaired cognitive function. Um, and, you know, we need to look at those things I've talked about, internal in, uh, consistency, inconsistency, measured function. Um, again, you've got to have those, the classic exclusions. Um, and we need to see that people have impairment. I see people that have been diagnosed, have a diagnosis, but they have no impairment. Now, most diagnoses, said tongue in cheek, you know, there has to be a, an impairment um, actually to meet diagnostic criteria. So, you know, I think we've got to be careful not to over-label people. Um, that said, um, you know, sometimes having a label can be really helpful because it can validate people's experience and the label FND can be very helpful. I've had clients um, for treatment and they, and I said I don't really treat FND, but to make things helpful, we've actually reclassified um, their FND um, and label just the symptoms that they were presenting and then and then we've been able to lead on to, to shift and change um, and these would be the same exclusions if we had a, a FCD uh, diagnosis. Now I just wanted to actually before I go to questions and I can see that the chat's been going um, you know the reality is that FND can, and I've already alluded to this, can have the complications of pain, you know, your anxiety and depression, um, and they might be <laughs> predisposing conditions, they might be vulnerabilities, they may have been a previous diagnosis, they may be a, a reactive response to the med going through the medical system, they might be a response to having um, an FND, uh, you know, some hemiparesis or whatever the difficulty might be. Um, and then you're likely to have some sleep disturbance because we know that pain and anxiety and depression, apart from the obvious things of coffee after three o'clock um, and alcohol, um, could, causing sleep disturbances. They, so you can see that you start to get this terrible swirl of things. Um, and if there's a sleep disturbance or insomnia, there's likely to be fatigue. And there's litigation. And so I meet people who are exhausted by the medical legal system and they actually wish they'd never got into it. Um, and others, of course, are pursuing litigation because um, they need litigation to, to give them the financial support they're going to need for their ongoing care um, throughout their life and the compensation for loss. And there are people who seek litigation um, as a way to increase their financial position. And I see all sorts. Um, 
So I am going to turn over to questions, which I think will be managed elsewhere, but I also just want to check up the, the chats and um, I'm hoping um, I can answer any questions if there are any there. So we've got about, we've got a few minutes for questions, Michelle. That was, that was uh, terrific. Terrific. terrific, terrific. I learned, I learned so, so much. much. I hope it wasn't too fast because once I get in a role, I actually find it hard to <laughs> pace myself. No, that was, no, that great. was great. So have we got any questions? If anybody, anybody has a question, has a question you, can you can unmute yourself. yourself. Oh, here's one. So there's, uh, one the, there's, a, there's a question in the chat room. How do you deal with patients who do not accept that there is no organic cause? Um, well, yes. So, I mean, that's always tricky. And that's one of the reasons why the, um, the, the favourite expression uh, when talking about functional neurological disorder is to say there is no structural basis. So, you know, there's no organic cause in the sense that there's nothing wrong with your brain structures you know you've got a beautiful healthy um, brain now if someone has fnd that gives them distress when you tell them they have this lovely healthy beautiful brain they go oh phew all right and if they're going no it's not no it's not then that's a flag that there's something else going on but if you tell someone that you know the the the, the brain as an organ organic organ if the brain as an organ is, is beautiful and perfect um, but there's this there's this functional problem going on like it's not communicating properly um, then you know you're, you're not dismissing the person you're you're validating that there's something wrong now I forgot to, in, in my talk because I haven't got any slides for it was um, and I mentioned this colleague of mine unfortunately in Ballina underwater but um, she actually has a virtual reality system set up. So she gets people coming in and their family are there and they've got this hemiparesis or, I mean, some of them come in even in wheelchairs and the family and them, and they don't um, move their arm. And then in virtual reality, and it's quite amazing, I've done it to, uh, um, to see what it's like. Um, and it takes a couple of sessions because, you know, it's, can be quite confronting but one of them is basically you go snorkeling on on the um the great barrier reef and you know she gets you to simply start touching in the screen so you obviously you start with your your hand and then say say you're you're demonstrating a, a left hemiparesis and you start going like that and then you're so immersed in this environment and then she'll ask you to come and and you know, touch something over here and then what happens is that people they actually start moving their arms and she's filming them doing this so she can give the film to the family and so forth and so you know and, and then she's able to demonstrate that they've got some that there's a functional problem that the, the arm the brain is talking to the arm and the arm can move but there's this interference happening happening and um anyway she has, she does have amazing um results so i hope that asks answers your question sorry okay another another um question what is the prognosis um, with and without treatment um, and is it final the finalization of medication relevant to prognosis okay came very late to the presentation you know I think it would be really good if um, everybody involved in the litigation process actually got to find out um, what happened after litigation was, was settled um, as I mentioned I, I, I provide um, treatment um, so people I don't see for usually see for uh, assessments. There are people who come to me for treatment, and some, you know, I'm thinking of people with complex multiple trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and so forth. Um, and they they have the finalisation of their litigation, and they continue to do the best they can, and and manage. And this is when they've got, if you like, um, valid concerns. They, they manage and the difficulties still go up and down as life goes up and down and they continue to um, in, engage with all the, the help they want. And then obviously there are those that suddenly um, become perfect and, and go off. And I think it would be really good to have more statistics. The thing about FND, if it is FND, um, the, the injection of money actually won't make any difference. But again, I don't think we have enough 
research that tracks people over over this whole process to see what what happens. So, um, you know, people who are presenting with a somatic disorder or a, a, a clear exaggeration um, and um, one of those profiles, they they absolutely get better. But FND is is slightly different to those. So again, I hope that. Uh, the prognosis, the prognosis is very good if people get, as I mentioned, good education. Um, people with FND actually want to get better um, because it causes them significant distress. Wow. wow. Any other Any questions? Other questions? No. no. Now, no, I have seen before. Usually, when Usually there's, when a, there's lot a lot of questions, of questions it's because, because your, your, your presentation, presentation is so is great. So great. Um, um, hang on, hang on. Oh, yeah. 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 How is the average condition of the patient's insight? Is the clinical and cognitive insight good or bad? Um, well, Gemma, that's a good question. And it's a bit like how long is a piece of string because people don't have insight as a black and white thing. So um, some people can have insight and understanding in some areas and not others. I guess we all can have a blind spot too, can't we? Um, but insight, I mean, obviously, a good, good psychoeducation um, can actually cure a lot of things. And um, I guess uh, for any of the insurers there or people who've been in the system for a long time like I have, um, ACC in New Zealand, so that's the Accidents Compensation System in New Zealand, is, is have done some fantastic research in, in, the, in the nebulous post-concussive um, syndrome area. And they have found that good education psychoeducation at the, at the very beginning um, mitigates a lot of the downstream uh, difficulties that pe people have, but also the downstream costs associated with those things. And so, you know, as a clinician, particularly when I was working um, at the more acute end and not the, you know, a couple of years of complicated stuff, you know, I, I do wish I'd see people a lot earlier in their medical legal journey than I do. Um, because you can absolutely see windows where a bit of education good quality psychoeducation would have made a profound difference to, to people's trajectory. Um, and that's not just building insight, but it, it, insight requires understanding and acceptance. So it's not enough just to give people information. You actually have to wait for those other two things to happen first. The insurers out there, I do suggest you do dig up that ACC research um, from New Zealand. I think it's really, really interesting um, because if you're not aware, ACC in New Zealand is like TAC in Victoria, so it's non-litigious, and it's, it's interesting to see the, the, the slight differences in the system. So, any other questions or comments? Oh, there's one. Thank you for covering such, such complex conditions. Condition. Clarify your comment that there are no major psychological, psychological issues in people with FND because psychiatrists often conceptualise this condition as a physical expression of psychological distress or internal conflict. It was referred to as conversion disorder in DSM-4 with the idea that the psychic stress is converted to neurological symptomatology. Well, that's right. And that is the old um, conversion disorder. Um, and, we, and as I said, FND has much bigger scope than, than conversion disorder. And as I showed you in the previous slides, which my, I understand you have access to, only 40% of people who, who are diagnosed with FND have a clearly agreed upon diagnosis of a psychiatric condition underneath it. Um, I do think, and, and there is, um, again, this is, my clin clinical impression, um, you know, I can, only so much research or PhD as any one person can do. I have noticed that you know certain um, cultural ethnic groups have a much bigger vocabulary to describe their psychological distress than others, and I think that makes people think perhaps that they're presenting with these more obvious neurological or physiological symptoms because of the language that they use. But sometimes, you know, if you're, if you're working, if you've got an interpreter, if you can dig down a bit more, I find that, or given the language, um, you know, there's some wonderful um, diagrams of facial expressions because facial expressions are universal. And sometimes people use 
without the vocabulary, if they haven't got the vocabulary, um, they use physical terms to approximate for some internal feeling that they have. And we know that emotions have an internal feeling because emotions are, are driven by neurotransmitters and hormones and so forth. So that we know there's an internal uh, association with them. And when you show them these charts, and I, I can't remember how many there are, there's probably 40 common universally recognized facial expressions. And when you show them those, they'll actually identify the emotion and then you can start giving them the vocabulary. But again, that, that takes the luxury of time and, and I'm aware that, um, you know, sometimes we don't always have that. But um, I think that's why it's necessary to have a multidisciplinary diagnosis. So you do get the eyes of a psychiatrist, a neurologist and a, and a neuropsychologist on the case just to help with some of these subtleties. Makes sense, Makes sense, doesn't it? Look, okay, everybody, okay, thank, thank you so, you so much, much for your time, your time and especially, especially thank you, Nicola, to you. To you. It's, it's been, been our been pleasure to have you do this, this talk, talk with us. With us. And, and thank you thank for you making the slides and allowing, allowing us to record and make, record make those available to people, people afterward. Um, um, once again, thank you all for your time. Look out for our coming up seminars because we've got some other amazing people. But once again, thank you a lot, Nicola. Thank you for having me. You're incredible. Bye. 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 All right. Here we go.